Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I am Dennis. I use they and he pronouns, and I'm a learning officer here at EGAL. For any participants who are not able to see me, I am a white non-binary individual wearing a dark green sweater and a black headset. As the moderator for today's session, I'll mostly be hiding in the background to make sure things are running smoothly. Since we are doing this in a virtual format, I'll go over a few of the technical aspects to orient you before we get started. First, as you'll have noticed when you arrived, this session is being recorded. We'd like to remind everyone for safety, for the safety and comfort of everyone attending, screen recording is not permitted. Next, for anyone not yet familiar with Zoom's interactive features, I'd like to take just a few quick moments to run through those interactive features with everyone. First, you should see a ribbon with buttons such as chat and Q&A at the bottom of your screen. If you do not see these buttons, you can just scroll your mouse or swipe along the bottom of your screen and the ribbon should pop up. Clicking the chat button will open the chat pod. Once opened, you'll see a drop down menu that allows you to choose who can see your chat contributions. We encourage you to share your comments with everyone, but you're also welcome to send messages privately to the session hosts if you wish your comments to remain anonymous. I will also be dropping um, session handouts into the chat pod throughout the session, so you'll want to keep that handy. Please feel free to drop in any questions that come up for you using the Q&A pod at any point uh, during the session. We may have a chance to address some questions in the moment, and we have also reserved time at the end to address anything that has been submitted. For all other types of discussion, I'd ask you to please use the chat pod. Also, please note that participant lines are in listen only mode today, so you will not be able to ask any questions verbally. All questions and comments must be submitted in writing. Also, please note that closed captioning has been enabled for this session. If you'd like to show or hide the subtitles on your screen, simply, simply click the CC button, which you can find beside the chat button at the bottom of your screen. And finally, if you encounter any issues during today's webinar, do not hesitate to reach out to me privately by chat. Now, before I pass the mic over to our presenters, Noah and Dan, I'd like to offer a brief introduction to EGAL and uh, our land acknowledgement. For those of us who don't know us yet, EGAL is Canada's leading organization for 2S LGBTQI people and issues. We improve and save lives through research, education, awareness, and by advocating for human rights and equality in Canada and around the world. Our work helps create societies and systems that reflect the universal truth that all persons are equal and none is other. We acknowledge that our work take, takes place on the traditional territories of diverse Indigenous peoples who have stewarded these lands for millennia. These lands, now known as Canada, are home to a rich tapestry of Indigenous cultures, languages, and traditions. Although we have participants joining us from various locations, we at EGAL are located in downtown Toronto, and as such, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are hosting this webinar on the traditional lands of the Huron-Wendat, Seneca, and Mississaugas of the Credit and Haudenosaunee's people. It also uh, important, is important to acknowledge that I myself am a settler on these lands and that Indigenous peoples have been living and working on since time immemorial and continue to have community on today. The social and economic powers afforded to settlers today is deeply tied to this history. It is important that all settlers today recognize the contributions and historic importance of Indigenous peoples and to commit to making the promise and the challenge of truth and reconciliation real in our communities. I ask that we all remain aware of the colonial context in which we are embedded as we reflect and discuss the session's topics. May we all work together towards healing, justice, and a future where Indigenous peoples are empowered to thrive and flourish across Turtle Island. And with that said, I'd like to welcome Dan to begin the presentation. Thanks, Dennis. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the presentation today. Uh, our presentation is entitled Highlights from Miguel's Working for Change, Understanding the Employment Experiences of Two-Spirit, Trans, and Non-Binary People in uh, Canada. And I'd like to thank the research team and also everyone, all, all the attendees, because I know that there's plenty of places that you could be right now. Um, there's a lot of different competing interest that you may have. It, it's probably your lunch hour and you've chosen to spend it with us today. So thank you for that. Um, just a brief introduction to myself. 
Um, I am a white settler uh, trans man. Um, I'm wearing a blue button down shirt. Um, I'm bald, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your taste, I guess. Um, I am an associate professor teaching at Carleton University in Ottawa. I'm cross appointed between the Institute of Interdisciplinary Studies and the Feminist Institute of Social Transformation. Um, as I said, I am trans. I transitioned in Toronto during my PhD uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And my research focuses on, it's in the area of trans studies, more specifically trans political economy. And in particular, um, I focus on issues of trans unemployment, underemployment, and employment. And hi folks, I'm Noah, I'm the other presenter. You'll have to forgive me because for some reason um, my computer is lagging a little bit. So I'm having trouble switching the slides. Um, it'll just be one moment while we get that moving again. There we go, hi, that's me. So I've been an EGAL research officer since 2023 after finishing my Master of Women's and Gender Studies at Carleton University, supervised by one Dr. Dan Irving. So this is a fun full circle moment for the two of us. I am a uh, white third generation settler. Um, I am a non-binary transmasculine person with shoulder length brownish hair. <laughs> Uh, wearing a white button down with blue octopi on it. And uh, I'm very excited to be here today, but for now I'll pass it back over to Dan so we can get started with the presentation itself. So I'm gonna start with the background of the project and the methodology. So Working for Change uh, is a, was a multi-year mixed method study uh, that focused on identifying and addressing both systemic and interpersonal challenges, including discrimination and harassment experienced by two-spirit trans and non-binary people in Canada while trying to navigate the workforce. Uh, the reason that we conducted this study, there was previous research that had been done on issues that two-spirit trans and non-binary people faced in terms of systems of economic advantage, but there wasn't a lot of work specifically done on issues of um, employment or underemployment. And so we wanted to build on the existing scholarship and particularly look at um, barriers to employment within a Canadian context. In terms of research that was specific to two-spirit individuals and communities at, um, that was distinct from other gender diverse groups, the research is very limited. And so we wanted to be able to address that specific um, gap in the scholarship so that we could not only add to scholarship, but add to um, policy and uh, community education. Uh, we also wanted to look at the ways that the economic conditions have changed following the start of the COVID-19 COVID pandemic. So we know that economic conditions worsened for everyone um, and our conditions of employment had changed, but we wanted to look specifically into that. And I would also like to mention um, a huge thank you to our funder, uh, Women and Gender Equality Canada. Uh, Wage Canada for funding the project. The objectives of the project were threefold. First, we wanted to identify systemic and interpersonal factors that contribute to barriers um, for employ of two, sorry, contribute to barriers to employment for two-spirit trans and non-binary individuals. We also wanted to generate practical suggestions for employers, for government agencies, to be able to start to include uh, two-spirit trans and non-binary workers across a variety of fields. So we really wanted to make sure that we were including all economic sectors when we were doing the project. And we also um, 
very importantly, wanted to highlight the ways that the existing current legislation that identifies gender identity and or indigeneity as a protected category in employment settings isn't enough. So we wanted to be able to address other ways um, to, to look at and um, resolve oppression. We like to work in threes, and so our research questions were also threefold. Um, we wanted to probe what the um, employment, underemployment, and unemployment experiences of two-spirit, trans, and non-binary people are. We wanted to look at how two-spirit, trans, and non-binary people experience the workplace. And we also wanted to explore what forms of bias, discrimination, and violence are present in places of employment. In terms of our research activities, as I mentioned, it was a mixed method study. So we had a national survey um, that was hosted online. Um, we had, after we cleaned up data, 555 participants in that survey. And we also had semi-structured interviews that we conducted, um, and we did this with 79 participants. While we were designing the data collection materials, so the survey uh, itself and the interview, the questions for both, um, we consulted with um, many members of community. And so our materials underwent uh, peer review and consultation. Um, and we also wanted to pay particular attention when designing the, the project to intersectional analysis, specifically looking at indigeneity and race. We also looked at intersections of ability and class to name a few. And please note, for the purpose of our presentation today, we're going to be looking at uh, findings from the interviews only. So we won't be looking at survey today, but we will be um, talking specifically uh, to the interviews that we conducted. In terms of demographics of interview participants, as I said, there was a total of 79 two-spirit trans and non-binary people who uh, agreed to take part in the interviews. Um, participants were from a range of 11 uh, Canadian provinces and territories. They were between the ages of 17 and 71 with an average age of 32. And they mainly were from urban areas. In terms of racial demographics, 49 participants were white, 17 were indigenous, two were black, and 11 identified as uh, people of color. And a large majority of our participants, so 59, or sorry, 51 out of 79 participants, uh, described themselves as having one disability or multiple disabilities. In terms of the gender breakdown, um, regarding gender identity of those who took, uh, who participated in the interviews, I wanted to draw your attention to um, a couple of key points. Um, one, as you see from the, the non-binary, the red column, um, the bulk of our participants identified as um, non-binary, so 36 in total. And Towards the, the end of the graph, there's uh, in, in the, the pink bar and the blue bar, we had one participant self-identify as um, a man and one as a woman. And this is significant because it speaks to the ways that sometimes trans people don't identify as trans. Um, people with trans history or trans experience often identify as men or women. So you may have people in your workplace that have trans experience or histories, but they don't identify overtly as trans. So now I'll pass it over to Noah. Thanks, Dan. 
So now we're going to be moving into an overview of the findings of the actual project. Um, using thematic analysis, our research team was able to note eight major themes under which sub-themes were organized. So the first was being two-spirit, trans, and non-binary at work, experiencing of quitting, leaving, or job loss, barriers to employment, experiences of under and unemployment, job seeking, experiences with employment service organizations, and supportive work environments. In today's presentation, due to time limits, we'll only be focusing on the bolded thematic areas, as well as presenting both recommendations we were able to identify during analysis, and as well as the ones that were offered to us directly from our participants when asked. Um, Dennis, I'm seeing someone has their hand raised at the moment. Um, yep, I'm gonna yeah. reach out to them through the chat. Um, For sure, but if folks I don't do, wanna... yeah, have questions, um, feel free to put it in the chat pod or the Q and A pod, and, and we'll get to that um, when we can. For sure. So I'll carry on, but thank you so much um, to that individual for. Um, reaching out and engaging. It's very exciting. So for our first section on research findings, we're going to focus on unemployment, underemployment, and precarious employment. This was the original focus of the study back when it was proposed, um, but considering how quickly one's experience of the labor force can change, particularly as the COVID-19 pandemic began to affect people's work lives, this was rapidly expanded. So we actually did start this project um, in March, 2020. Um, so that became a pretty defining factor in how we moved forward with our, um, with our research questions and with the data that we eventually collected. Um, just, to, just to do a quick overview before we get started, um, I figured I'd include some definitions, like working definitions of these terms to ensure that we're all on the same page. This was kind of what we were working with as we were moving through the project. So unemployment, meaning being without work due to layoff, quitting, contract termination, workplace dissolution, et cetera. Underemployment, we defined as being when a worker's qualifications, credentials, or experience level are significantly higher than their position or compensation. And finally, precarious employment, meaning gig, short-term contract, seasonal, informal, or otherwise unstable or unpredictable work. And finally, of course, all of this was mediated by the uh, worsening economic conditions created by the COVID-19 pandemic. So to begin, many participants found themselves occasionally or chronically underemployed, unemployed, excuse me, some shared experiences of being terminated abruptly after coming out or being outed as trans, often with vague reasoning such as it just isn't working out. Those working in fields related to their identity, such as service provision for other trans and non-binary individuals, sometimes had to leave their jobs due to the immense professional and personal strain that it could cause. And this is um, nicely illustrated by a quote from our third participant. They said, my job was particularly working with trans youth. I was the trans and non-binary youth program caseworker, and that was a lot of frontline. I was there for almost 10 years, and especially during the pandemic, it just took a really big toll. My mental health was really impacted by it. And there's so many young trans people, just from negligence, who die or are harmed. Others felt they had to leave their jobs due to transphobic or racist hostility in the workplace, or found that they were simply unable to find work while being open about their identity. As demonstrated by our quote by participant 40, who said, when I came out as non-binary, it was fine with that job. Then once that job ended because it was a limited term appointment, I could not find work for months. I was sending out applications and hearing nothing back. Finally, of the participants who had experienced unemployment or were currently unemployed, many expressed frustration with the failings of the various social supports meant to assist unemployed individuals, such as EIA in Manitoba or Ontario Works in the eponymous Ontario. These supports often did not provide a solid foundation upon which to search for work as they were intended. Participant 68 described their experience saying, Welfare accidentally paid me once too many times, 
and then dropped my monthly payments after that. I think the checks I was receiving were for $80. I kept telling them I can't live off this. And their response would be, send us your banking statements so we can double check. Then we'll see where the money has been going. And I'm sure nobody in this audience needs me to clarify that regardless of circumstance or where money is going, obviously $80 is physically impossible to survive for a full month on. Moving into underemployment, participants were frequently susceptible to underemployment in a, ver in a variety of forms, excuse me. For some, this included the, ability to, the inability to advance or promote in their current position. Participant 75 worked in healthcare and said, despite being more qualified than some applicants, I have been looked over for multiple positions based on my gender and sexuality, especially leadership. There tends to be, at least in healthcare, this idea that queer folks are good at educating, teaching and supporting, but not leading. For some, being underemployed meant being allocated responsibilities disproportionate to their position. Those working in service provision were again, particularly affected by this. Multiple participants noted that they were performing the duties of a higher position, but were not afforded the title or benefits of such a position because they did not have the necessary qualifications such as a master's degree. As demonstrated in the quote here by participant three, the red tape of specific qualification requirements can create major barriers for those who are multiply marginalized. They said, I worked with many trans refugees and a lot of times you get racialized trans women who are highly educated, highly qualified, but then they have to take jobs like working in a coffee shop. Not that those jobs are bad, but they are highly overqualified. That has to do not only with racism, but also with transphobia. Finally, many participants found that they needed to work multiple jobs due to lack of shifts or unpredictable pay or to supplement income when the compensation is not a livable wage. This particular issue is not only one of underemployment, but overlaps into our next slide, which is precarious employment. For various reasons, some participants turned to gig work or self-employment. This could be due to prior negative experiences in formal workplaces, or an attempt to avoid such experiences in the first place. For some, it was the result of being unable to secure a stable employment, and for others, this was simply their preferred work style or the way to pursue their passion. Regardless of the reason, participants frequently reported that the lack of stability had a profound sense of impact on their sense of security and wellness. Those working in the arts and other short-term work experienced significant strain as many found that working to secure a new engagement once the current one had finished was as much work as the jobs themselves. This can not only cause burnout from overworking, but participants reported that they felt the quality of their work was diminished since they could not devote all their time and energy to the current gig. Participants 56 described this saying, I'm pretty much chronically underemployed, but also chronically overemployed. Underemployed in the sense that I'm not getting paid enough for the work that I do, not even close but overemployed in the sense that I'm consistently and constantly thinking of my next job. My mind is constantly on work. Some also noted that on top of the individual disadvantages caused by transphobia or racism, the economic shift structurally in recent decades has created itself challenges. Participant 78 said, I've been at the end of Generation X. I've been hearing all these all my life about all these great opportunities in the future when the baby boomers retire, I'm still waiting and looking for those opportunities. We've just seen the evolution away from long-term employment growth where people are treated as valuable assets to more of a short-term gig economy. We're not going to bring someone in at an entry level, train them and have them grow. Finally, just a quick note on how the COVID-19 pandemic continued to affect these experiences across the board. Naturally, this was kind of a devastating experience for many, regardless of identity. However, 2STNB or Two-Spirit Trans and Non-Binary Communities were profoundly impacted by the economic ramifications of this event, as job loss can become even more damaging for those who are economically vulnerable or susceptible to hiring discrimination. Participant 65's experience here is a succinct example of how even without being um, affected by the mass layoffs that occurred at the beginning of the pandemic, 
Many had to leave their jobs regardless as a result of the pandemic due to lack of consideration for increased risk levels among those with disabilities. Participant 65 says, my employer was making us go back in person four days a week during the height of 2021, where there was another resurgence of Omicron. My partner who I live with is sick and disabled. I didn't want to work in an office job that we've been doing remotely for two and a half years already. I asked if I could work from home, they said no. They also told my coworker whose mom was going through chemo that she had to come in person too. So we both left. This is a good example of, as Dan mentioned in our, um, in our opening remarks uh, regarding our demographics, there's a significant overlap between um, trans folks and experiences of disability. Thus that creates a new dimension that made, that made the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic even more challenging for a lot of people. And with that, I'll pass it back over to Dan for our next section on research findings. Thanks, Noah. Um, for this section, I want to shift our focus a bit so that we're looking at um, experiences on the job, what it's like to be two-spirit, trans, and non-binary at work. Occasionally, participants reported to us extreme examples of violence uh, or overt harassment in the workplace that was coming from coworkers, clients, or superiors. So for instance, participant eight explains, I had clients again, not only out me, but basically joke that they were going to take me outside and beat me and try to see what was under my clothing. There was also a client who sexually harassed and assaulted all staff. He wasn't banned from anything. It's also important to note, particularly with um, the current rise of anti-trans hate and the particular discourses concerning trans people as groomers, a lot of participants, especially those who are working in education fields or were working with youth, um, were subject, they spoke about being subject to accusations of grooming um, youth based on their identity, on, on their gender identities, um, and that those working with youth in any capacity, regardless of whether or not they were accused of being groomers, they were acutely aware that this was a risk. And so it really uh, increased their anxiety at work in, in these particular sectors. It's also worth noting that trans feminine workers and non-binary workers who are read as feminine reported experiencing higher levels of sexual harassment at work. And while overt harassment and violence is significant and was reported, we had many more um, experiences explained to us about other forms of manifestations of um, gender-based uh, and intersectional oppressions at work. Um, and this, well, I'll, I'll get into uh, what those, what that looks like in a minute. Um, there were a lot of coping strategies that participants uh, would talk about um, to explain the ways that they would try to mitigate uh, oppression as it arose in the workplace. And so we want to direct your attention to subtler forms of oppression that occur in the workplace, as well as the ways that participants talked about dealing with tensions on the job. Um, three in particular, um, sorting, sorting through um, gender identities, so uh, emotional labor and extra, extra workload. And so in terms of um, sorting through identities and putting identities into categories, participant seven sums that up best when they say, I go by different pronouns in my workplace. I actually started calling them safety labels, as in the different labels I have for different sets of people. Like me saying I'm a trans man, that's a safety label. Yeah, that's me giving an easier answer to a question that has more, that has a more complicated one just for my own sake of not needing to explain it. Not having to explain my entire existence just makes my existence safer. 
And one of the reasons why these safety labels are so significant is that many gender diverse people can't live true to themselves at work because they're anxious or afraid that people won't understand or that there'll be negative consequences if they were to explain their identity. So they'll often use another identity that they feel may be easier understood or more palatable for uh, management, human resources, uh, coworkers or clients on the job. Another strategy that we encountered that participants were using quite frequently was the was non-disclosure of identity. And a few uh, participants who were old enough to remember the don't ask, don't tell, the US military strategy uh, in the 1990s likened non-disclosure to don't ask, don't tell. And so in this way, they would erase themselves as two-spirit uh, trans and non-binary workers by simply not saying anything at all about their gender identity. In the context of settler colonialism, which frames Canadian society, we really think it's important to highlight the levels of anti-Indigenous racism that Two-Spirit participants were encountering on the job. And this was another way that they would um, try to mitigate oppression on the job because it wasn't just about gender identity, it was also about race in the context of settler colonialism. And so they would often report as well, trying to sort through their identities um, as twofold identities, one as queer and gender diverse individuals and also as in indigenous people. So participant 27 explains, yeah, lots of shrouding and sort of mystery kind of stuff and also using general queerness as a smoke screen. So I think of the two spirit part of me as the sacred, sacred queer part, and then the queerness or like bi or feminist parts, more like the protective parts. So again, there was the need to stress anti-Indigenous racism as a more prominent concern for Two-Spirit um, participants beyond homophobia and transphobia on the job. Participant 65 explains, so yes, I've experienced racism at every level of job. A lot of the times it's microaggressions. So saying ignorant comments or just not acknowledging that Indigenous people are even present. People just didn't think we existed in the present. And so, oh, that's okay, no. And, and so again, it's, it's, this, it's this notion that um, microaggressions are taking place not only in terms of uh, sexuality or gender diversity, which defines two-spirit identity, but two-spirit identity is also defined by indigeneity. And the fact that many two-spirit workers had to try to hide the indigenous part of them at work or that they weren't being acknowledged because of the way that anti-indigenous um, racism also often makes them into some kind of past, that something that existed in the past that doesn't continue to um, exist, thrive and um, work today. One of the other key ways that participants talked about coping with um, oppression on the job was through emotional labor. And emotional labor means to manage the emotions or the responses of others. And in this case, um, that's uh, particular to the emotions and responses of others to uh, racialized and or gender diverse identity in the workplace. And so, Participant 73 explains this when they say, I would get coworkers who would come into the office I was working in and call me a lady or woman. And then they would go back to their desk and they would send me a big long email about how sorry they were and what a big mistake it was. And there was just a lot of emotional labor I had to do to make other people feel okay for mistreating me. So again, that sense of having to 
take care of somebody because they they made a mistake they misgendered this participant and then in doing so the participant ha has to spend more time to try to navigate the feelings that their coworker had to misgendering them and so it puts the uh, trans and non-binary and two-spirit worker in a very awkward position, but it also takes a lot of resources um, away from, from us. Participant 11 further explains uh, emotional labor on the job, particularly in terms of educational work that they had to do. They explain there's definitely education out there, and I've provided my workplaces workplaces with resources on how to find out what being non-binary is. And a lot of people think it's my job as a non-binary person to educate people about being non-binary, and it's really not. I'm trying to go about my day too. I have other things to do. And this is particularly significant because often trans people, non-binary people, two-spirit people are called upon to educate others. And while that may be okay in certain circumstances, it can often be extremely hard because at the workplace, we're being evaluated on our performances. And those performances are not counting emotional labor. They're not counting educational labor that are identity-based and identity-focused. Uh, management is looking at uh, performance on the job. And so this type of work can not only be distracting, but it can also have harmful impacts on uh, performance reviews or job, job reviews. One of the major manifestations of um, oppression that arose amongst our participants were microaggressions. And there were so many instances of microaggressions. We actually didn't go and put quotes because we weren't sure we'd be able to do justice. So instead, um, I'm going to go through just some uh, definitions with you. So micro microaggression refers to comments or behaviors that, well, are not overtly or intentionally discriminatory, betray a, ne a, a negative perception of a marginalized group. And so I, I that that common expression that we use death by a thousand cuts and so a microaggression isn't overt violence or discrimination or harassment it's often these very little um inadvertent comments comments that may not necessarily be uh, intentional but they certainly build up and they have a very negative consequence on those who are um, being targeted by them. One example of a microaggression is misgendering. And participants um, were very careful to explain to us that this form of microaggression isn't one single mistake or a couple of mistakes of you know calling somebody the wrong gender or assuming their gender. This was something that was accumulative. So somebody was doing it deliberately or it felt like they were doing it deliberately and they were doing it repeatedly. And so misgendering is um, defined as the consistent use of wrong pronouns despite correction, the application of gender terms like ladies or gentlemen, uh, preventing employees from communicating their pronouns. And this came up a lot. So particularly we all have email, we all have eight email signatures. And so often management would prevent, for, for example, agendered or um, non-binary employees from putting they, them on their email signatures. Um, and, and one's preferred name on name tags is another example of a microaggression through misgendering where an employee would be refused um, the the right to put their preferred name on their name tag. Another example of a microaggression is exclusion. And so participants would often note that 
they were included in important communications regarding their position. So for example, email strings that were going around about a project that they were involved in, um, that they were repeatedly excluded from um, those email communications, or that when they offered ideas or suggestions at work, uh, these would be ignored repeatedly, or that they had their expertise or authority minimalized. To continue on with microaggressions, um, there were many different strategies um, that were used um, in terms of res responding to um, microaggressions, but also the ways that this would go back and forth between uh, employer and employee. And so contrary, as I was explaining in the last slide, contrary to the stereotype that trans people are being oversensitive or are being um, difficult or militant, um, they would often raise issues about what their preferred name was or what their preferred pronouns are. And they would be met. So that strategy of trying to self-advocacy would often be met with a silencing strategy where they would be, you know, coworkers may say, you're being too sensitive. Or trans people would not want to bring up um, issues of uh, race, gender diversity, because they were fearful or anxious that they would be cast as that difficult employee or that militant trans person. Another way that um, our participants were silenced in the workplace when they brought up concerns about um, gender diversity, they were often met with, well, we're an inclusive workplace. And so workplaces that have adopted the inclusive label, and this can include uh, workplaces who express a commitment to um, EDIA or equity, diversity, uh, inclusion and access programs will often not accept feedback um, if more work needs to be done or particular instances that have been experienced on the workplace. Instead of being reflexive and critiquing and seeing the way that they could improve, um, our participants were often met with, well, we're inclusive already. And again, that puts um, the person who is trying to, to self-advocate or advocate on behalf of others in a, a position of being a, a troublemaker. And this, again, can, can be risky when we're being monitored at work and our performance is being evaluated. Um, this Another silencing strategy um, came about when workers would would say well we are lgbtq plus um and so that they would they again this notion that they were being inclusive um under the moniker uh you know the the under the rainbow but they weren't they wouldn't really acknowledge the ways that gender identity and gender diversity is different from sexuality or sexual orientation, and it presents itself differently within the workplace. And so when trans people, when non-binary people would um, raise issues, they would be told, well, we already are LGBTQ uh, inclusive. And now I'll turn it over to Noah. Thanks, Dan. So following that section, which of course was quite heavy, um, the final theme we'll be highlighting today is supportive work environments. While as this presentation is noted, um, 2ST and B individuals face significant disadvantages when looking for or maintaining employment. Excuse me, many participants were also able to share positive experiences that they have had in the workplace or instances that they felt truly supported as an employee or as a person. This word cloud that you can see on your screen here um, is included in our full report and provides an overview of some of the most common themes that were noted when participants were asked what supported the workplace might look for them. So we've got feeling supported, feeling like I can be myself, um, some concrete suggestions like inclusive washrooms, 
representation rather than tokenization, zero tolerance for bigotry, etc. So to delve more specifically into some of these uh, these themes, a big one that came up for folks was uh, training. So workplace inclusion training was reported to be optional more often than it was mandatory. And participants would note that those who needed it most, as in individuals with clear negative biases, were not the same people that would choose to attend an optional training. Even when inclusion training was provided and mandated, several participants found that the information provided was too basic to be of any concrete use, as was the experience of participant nine here, who said, we're typically doing company-wide education campaigns, we'll bring in guest speakers, but it's like queer 101 is the level we're at in terms of being able to communicate and provide beginner language. A couple different participants commented to me that they were sick of hearing about the acronym, they knew that L was for lesbian, et cetera. And those foundational concepts are integral, but that can't be where the education ends because as we've demonstrated here, there's a lot more to it than simply understanding who is under the rainbow as it were. A second um, prominent theme was inclusive policies and practices. So participants noted that workplaces with clearly communicated and consistently applied policies regarding names, pronouns, respect, or inclusion promoted wellness and a sense of support. As it is often the case that inclusion policies may be on the books as it were, but that it becomes a challenge to ensure they are applied when needed. And this, uh, the importance of this is demonstrated here by this quote from participant 73 who said, the moment I started being respected even by just a few people and I had my coworkers using my pronouns, I felt so hopeful. It just totally changed everything for me once I had supportive coworkers, once I had allies in the workplace. I just kept thinking, is this what it's like for cis people? They can just go to work and feel supported. So as we can see, just a simple change of language or um, the application of a certain amount of effort um, can be a really, really huge thing um, for someone who is gender diverse in their workplace and feeling like they belong there and that they're welcome. Another theme that came up was having um, two S LGBTQI coworkers. And many stated that one of the keys to feeling supported in the workplace was to have peers or superiors that shared their experiences and understood what they, what they were going through. This could create a stronger sense of solidarity and safety and could also help avoid instances of tokenization. So that's more um, a suggestion that it can be applied to folks on hiring committees, folks who have some influence on who makes up their staff when considering, okay, how are we going to be inclusive? How are we going to create a workplace that um, reflects the diversity of, of human experience? And while saying that, if you're asking yourself that question now, uh, we also have a couple of different suggestions that we were able to distill from the themes of our work, of the themes of our data, excuse me. <laughs> Been saying the word work a lot today. <laughs> so the first one would be, of course, as mentioned on the previous slide, careful and considerate use of language. And the first thing that comes to folks' minds is usually the use of people's correct pronouns. And based on participant 73's experience, of course, this is critical as one of the most common examples of workplace support. But this can also apply to gendered terms, as Dan mentioned in the previous section, addressing a group as folks, friends, or team, or any sort of neutral um, group greeting like that is infinitely preferable to ladies and or gentlemen, guys or gals, that sort of thing. And of course, this is not to say that mistakes are unacceptable because everyone makes mistakes, but a quick apology and a correction is all that's really needed. People, most people understand that changing our language habits can be challenging, so making a clear effort to practice and correct yourself can make all the difference. The second point that is important to note is that it's, it can be incredibly supportive and helpful to stand up for others, as it can be exhausting for a trans person to constantly reassert their identity or defend themselves in the workplace, as we remember the fear of being cast as difficult. So modeling respect of be respectful behavior yourself, making those corrections or having those uncomfortable conversations when needed, instead of leaving it to your gender diverse or queer coworker really shows them that you have their back. 
this can be especially impactful if you're in a leadership position. Finally, self-reflexivity and willingness to learn. Since we as humans are always changing, learning is an ongoing process rather than a destination to be reached. It is highly recommended to remain curious and open to new information when working with EDIA policies, um, taking the initiative to seek out knowledge for yourself rather than expecting your coworker to fill in all those gaps as that can detract from their experience at work, their sense of safety or their performance. Finally, moving into our last section, we have some recommendations and conclusions for you. And we'll begin that specifically with those offered by our participants. We did uh, give our participants an opportunity to share anything that they would change or recommend that could go towards improving um, two-spirit trans and non-binary inclusion in the workplace. And that full list is available in the report as well, but here's some of the main notes that were provided. We have um, the, the themes that were already mentioned in my previous section, but we also have some more concrete approaches such as providing mentorship and coaching opportunities to ensure that people are able to uh, move forward and advance in their workplaces. Um, ensuring benefits plans include gender affirming care and paid time off for transition related care. Um, and again, ensuring accessible gender neutral washrooms are available for staff as that is, you know, a hot button issue of the day and can be a really high uh, point of anxiety and stress for a lot of people. Finally, it's integral that workplaces make the effort to show their support year round, not just during pride season. A lot of our participants did note that come June, suddenly their employer would be trotting out the rainbows and making this huge um, outward display of, of prideful uh, support, but that the other 11 months of the year, their concerns would pretty much go unheard. So it's important to make sure that that is consistent and um, yeah, and consistent because otherwise all those rainbows uh, don't mean very much in the end and can even be hurtful to see. So finally, this table kind of demonstrates the breadth of the recommendations we were able to generate from our study and uh, data because change needs to happen on every level. So the Working for Change report provides recommendations for increasing, creating an inclusive working environment, whether you're a coworker, an employer, or a government body, which of course is not an individual, but my speaking notes did not consider that. So much like the previous slide, this is a very brief overview and the full extent of the recommendations can be found in the report. Some of these recommendations, particularly those for governments and systems relates to points that we couldn't cover in this presentation due to time constraints. So I'll briefly just highlight a few of those right now. Um, in the government and systems column, you can see that uh, some of the suggestions were implementing a universal basic income for all, as this can assist those who are precariously employed or those who are struggling to re-enter the workforce after being unemployed. Furthermore, it's critical that um, systems reinvest in affordable housing, reliable public transit, and mental health services, as this was a significant barrier to employment experienced by our participants. Having a solid foundation is critical to the ability to remain gainfully employed and financially secure. Low income individuals rely on services such as housing assistance and public transit. And when these systems fail, it can be impossible to be, um, to have an experience of being a quote unquote reliable employee if you're always worried about um, showing up late to your shifts or, um, what state your home will be in when you return at the end of the day. So while these are not actual workplace suggestions, they are critical for ensuring that people are able to bring their best selves into the workplace. Fully decriminalizing sex work nationwide. So given the extensive historical role of sex work for two-spirit trans and non-binary communities, we decided that that would not be a subject that we would get into in this presentation as there's a lot of complexity there that we weren't able to cover in you know, such a short period. 
but we do have a section on sex work and the experiences of sex work um, that our participants shared in the report. And we would love to do uh, more work on that in the future and explore um, the continued role of sex work in our communities going forward. Finally, as I mentioned uh, previous, having support from individuals and organizations that understand your experiences, that can relate to you and um, recognize the kind of difficulties that you may have um, are critical to ensuring that people's needs are met. So our final suggestion is to provide funding for um, Indigenous-led, Black-led, and POC-led uh, employment support organizations, mental health services, and social supports. And with that, we thank you very much for attending today and uh, are ready to answer any questions that you might have. If you're not comfortable asking questions here, we also have um, our inbox open at research at agal.ca um, for any follow-up questions that you may have. So thank you all for listening. Thank you, Noah. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dennis. We do have a few minutes um, for questions. So if there was anything that was on top of anyone's mind um, for right now, you can feel free to drop that in the chat pod um, and we'd be happy to get to it. Um, otherwise, as Noah said, um, you can always connect with our research team um, at research at egal.ca. And for those in attendance today, we'll be um, sending a follow-up email as well uh, within 24 hours with the links to the present, um, the links to the research report, the Working for Change website, um, as well as a number of other links um, that, uh, you know, informed some of the pieces that Dan and Noah highlighted today in the presentation. But mainly in the chat, we're seeing like a lot of claps and um, appreciation and um, inspirations. Yeah, it was a fantastic um, presentation. I'm glad folks enjoyed it. It's really wonderful to see that people are that people are engaging and excited about the work that we're doing because that was one comment that I received a lot from the interviews that I conducted were participants saying, this work is needed. We're like, we would open the floor and say, like, is there anything else you want to say? And they'd go, thank goodness someone's doing this, which like right. sounds a little self-aggrandizing, but as someone in the community, I also agree. Yeah. Um, this is critical and everyone who attended today and is invested in ensuring that these that these findings don't go unrecognized are part of that movement. And we're really, mm -hmm. really excited that you're all here. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. And um, sorry, go Dan. Yeah, no, that was just well said by Noah. Um, and it, it's also important, I think a lot of uh, people who who I interviewed uh, really stressed the the need to get the story out there and to use whatever privilege we have and whatever leverage we have to be able to continue to advocate for um, you know hiring of, of trans and two-spirit people as well as creating positive work environments yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah absolutely. Uh, and for the folks that are still with us, I, I just wanted to mention, I, I put in the chat pod, um, this um, webinar today is just one um, in a series of four that EGAL has done. Um, so this was the final one. And at that link, you'll be able to find um, recordings of our uh, three previous sessions, um, Action Through Connection, um, Aging and Living Well, and Queering Mental Health Supports in Canada. So if any of those other topics interest you, um, I highly recommend um, you go through that link and um, watch some of those recordings. And that's where you'll be able to find this recording um, as well over the next few weeks. Um, so if you'd like to share this, we would highly appreciate that um, or to review the session as well. That will become available for, for you all. But I think with that, um, we're at the top of the hour now. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're good to wrap up. Um, as mentioned, if you can think of additional questions, please email them to us at research at egal.ca. If you'd like to stay informed of EGAL's work as well, you can follow us on all social medias. We're at EGAL Canada. And I just wanted to do one last thank you to Noah and Dan for their research and thoughtful presentation as we continue working for change. Uh, we at EGAL hope that all uh, you have all gained some new insights and inspirations for making your work, your communities, 
uh, more welcoming and inclusive of to us LGBTQI identifying people. And on behalf of VGAL, I would like to thank you for joining us. You can please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Au revoir. Thank you, thank you everyone. <laughs>